Produced for TV 17 Colony by the William K. Sanford Town Library. Japan, an ancient culture dating back thousands of years, a country famous for its temples, shrines, and rock gardens. Modern shopping centers, technology, and an abundance of consumer goods also define the Japan of today. Hidden in the mountains of Japan, just an hour and a half southeast of the ancient capital of Kyoto, is a famous historic town called Shigaraki. Located in Shiga Prefecture, it has been a major ceramic production site since the 13th century. At one time, it produced wares to meet the immediate needs of the mainly farming population, with items such as storage jars, large vats, and grating bowls. During the late 16th century, as the tea ceremony became more popular, so did the crude, unsophisticated wares of shigaraki, which captured the interest of tea devotees. Thought to be suitable objects for the aesthetics of the time, tea masters later began to order the production of these often warped and irregularly formed tea utensils. A town once defined by its highly revered ceramics is now better known for these cartoonish looking ceramic badgers called tanuki. These whimsical creatures began to be mass produced around the 19th century. Thought to be symbols of wealth and good fortune, they can be seen en masse throughout the town. Surrounded by tradition, yet creating his own modern aesthetic, is Shigaraki-born master ceramic artist Kyotsugu Sawa. Located along the foot of a hillside is his studio and kiln. At the age of 20, Sawa went to Kyoto to pursue studies in ceramics. Two years later, he returned to Shigaraki with skills to make thin, refined ware. Sawa thought Shigaraki-style ceramics to be easy, something anybody could do. Make a mistake, and it's Shigaraki ware. A well-known ceramist and friend of the family challenged this thought. They both made a piece, using the same clay and firing in the same kiln. Upon observing the finished pieces, Sawa saw that something unexplainable about them was very different. This started his journey with Shigaraki ceramics. One fine example of Sawa's ceramics is this simple, elegantly curved jar. The melted ash flows along the torso in a rich colored surface of natural glaze known as shizenyu. The scorched, blackened areas along the mouth of the piece give it a primordial look. This tall, simple vessel shows a typical color of shigaraki. Flames from the kiln fire leave imprints of fiery orange colors known as hiro. The rare greens and blues on this vase, mixed with areas of copper reds and browns, are the result of a quick cooling process called hikidashi. This coil thrown vessel, scored and torn at the rim, gives the feeling of movement suspended in time. The crudely formed edges are Sawa's way of expressing the visual strength of the rough, rocky Shigaraki clay. One distinctive feature of Shigaraki ceramics is indeed the clay. 
It is white and sandy with traces of iron and contains high amounts of feldspar and silica. When fired at high temperatures, these particles melt and appear like stars on the surface of the pots. Inviting us into his studio, Sawa shows us his technique for making jars. He uses a coil method and first forms the bottom section upside down. In working this way, Sawa can freely manipulate the shape of the piece. Building the jar with coils gives it a visually solid look. He proceeds to add another row of coils, pressing down and into each layer. He gradually builds the piece into a cone-like shape. Sawa is nearing the end of the first step in making the bottom section of the jar. Using a bamboo cutting tool, he evens out the top coil, forming a slight angle on which to place the floor of the piece. Measuring the width, he now forms the floor of the jar. It is placed on top. The edges are smoothed. Sawa puts damp pieces of cloth on the open edge of the piece to keep it moist while the rest is left to dry overnight. Wood is unloaded from the truck. A typical Shigaraki firing lasts four to five days. One firing uses anywhere from 250 to 300 bundles of wood. Most of the wood is red pine with a small portion of various hardwoods. This highly alkaline, iron-rich wood burns hot with long flames. The ash from the wood falls on the pots and reacts with the feldspar and iron in the pot's clay and gradually melts at high temperatures. 
This melted ash forms a natural glaze flowing in nuances of green, yellow, and brown colors. While the jar is left to dry, Sawa decides to make a bowl. He places a large piece of clay on the wheel. Starting from the center, he pounds it down with a palm of his hand. As he opens it into a large circle, he is careful to keep the outer walls thick. On the inside of the bowl, using a stiff piece of canvas, he presses out designs. On the outside of the bowl, with the flowing movement of his hand, he creates an incised surface. By leaving crude, ragged edges, Sawa emphasizes the visual strength of the clay. These indented surfaces become pools for glassy glaze to form during the wood firing. The next morning, after a few finishing touches, the bottom section of the jar is flipped over. Sawa recenters the piece on the wheel head. And joins the inside seams at the bottom. He adds more coils. This coil technique is a slow process, but Sawa never gets tired. He enjoys its rhythmic quality. Sawa likes leaving fingerprint impressions on the surface. He brings the piece inward to form the mouth. The mouth section of a jar has historical significance. It can be used to determine the period of time in which a piece of ceramics was made. However, Sawa's concern is an aesthetic one. Finding the balance between the body of the piece and the mouth is challenging. If the interplay between the two isn't balanced, the whole piece is aesthetically lost. The jar is now ready to be dried for firing.
At Sawa's studio, there are two types of wood fire kilns. Sawa will be firing the raw, unglazed pots in the large, multi-chambered climbing kiln called a noborigama. The design for this style kiln was brought over to Japan from Korea around the end of the 16th century. Before the fire is lit, offerings of sake, salt, rice, and branches of sakaki are offered to the kiln gods to ensure a successful firing. They are placed atop the kiln and remain there for the duration. Wood chopping is a long, arduous task that is just one part of the sometimes back-breaking wood firing process. It's now day three. The finely chopped pieces of wood are thrown into the side portholes, falling directly onto the pots. After the side ports are stoked, the wood is again loaded into the front. The kiln continues to be fed about every 10 minutes. Thick, black smoke fills the air. The fourth day into the firing, Sawa pulls a piece of his work out of the burning kiln. As it is brought into the cool air, it quickly oxidizes, resulting in a rare variety of aqua blues and greens. This technique is known as hikidashi. The crackling sound is the cooling of the hot pieces. The first chamber is finished and the door of bricks is put up and sealed with mortar. Sawa begins to load wood into the next chamber. <laughs> he finishes the firing 12 hours later. It is day five. After two days of cooling, Sawa unloads the kiln. The anticipation of unloading a kiln is great. There is always a mix of emotions. At first sight, some of the pots look charred or warped. Others are stuck together and even broken. Sawa comments on one of his pieces. He says it is too ordinary and describes how it could have been better. The unloading is only the beginning. The finishing work is yet to be done. Sawa uses a diamond cutter to detach some pots that glaze together during the firing. With the careful use of a pounding tool called a kama, and an electric grinder. He does the finishing work, 
trying not to damage the pieces. Washed and set outside to dry before being sent for exhibit. These earthy pieces decorate the familiar landscape from which they came. It's another day and Sawa continues to work bringing new ideas to a very old tradition. Produced for TV 17 Colony by the William K. Sanford Town Library.